Welcome to the Become a Writer Today podcast with Brian Collins. Here you'll find practical advice and interviews for all kinds of writers. Hi there, this is Brian Collins and welcome to the Become a Writer Today podcast. At the time of recording this episode, the 16th of April 2019, I'm putting the final touches to my book, This Is Working. And one of the things that I'm doing to put the final touches to this book is offering it to early or beta readers. And this is something I really recommend you do if you're an author or writer. That is to get early versions of your work in front of readers who can provide you with some feedback that you can use to fix issues in your book or your articles. Now, what I did is offered this book for free to readers on my email list. And then a couple of weeks after they read the book, I'll contact them and ask them if they spotted any issues that I should address or issues that were unclear. The other advantage is this approach will help you get reviews if you're writing a nonfiction book because you can involve your readers in the launch of your book. Even if you don't have an email list, you can still find early readers for your book by using a service like Author Marketing Club or even Readsy. In fact, Readsy have just launched a new service called Readsy Discover. And for approximately $50, you can upload your book to Readsy and they will find reviewers for your book. These reviewers will read your book before it's launched and Readsy will give you a page that you can share on social media or via email or elsewhere. And don't worry, the reviewers are all under an NDA or non-disclosure agreement, which means you don't have to worry about your copyright being breached and so on. But the key takeaway for you is if you're finalizing a book, get it in front of early or beta readers. And if you're simply working on articles and so on, find a way to get feedback from people who can help you improve with your craft. Now, let's get into this week's interview. Professor Michael A. Roberto teaches leadership, business strategy, and managerial decision-making at Bryant University in Rhode Island, as well as for the great courses. And I've taken a number of great courses over the years, and it's a fantastic way to learn more about creative thinking and so on while on the go. Professor Michael A. Roberto was also the author of several best-selling books. And in his latest work, Unlocking Creativity, he proposes six mindsets that can help entrepreneurs business leaders, and even writers unlock creative thinking. He's a New York Times best-selling author, and I was delighted to catch up with him. And in this interview, Michael and I talk about how he tests his ideas for articles and books like Unlocking Creativity, why he's a morning person and how it has helps his writing routine, how he balances lecturing with writing nonfiction articles and books, and his approach for turning his books into courses that students can get a lot from. We also cover a lot of other different topics. In the book, Unlocking Creativity, Michael explains how he got the idea from watching bad television. And I started by asking Michael to elaborate on that story. Sure. I am, you know, I was talking about the fact that when I grew up, when cable television was first introduced, I can remember uh, before that, you know, having just three options, CBS, ABC and NBC. And uh, Tuesday night, I, I wrote about Tuesday, September 11, I think 1979. And uh, there were three options on TV, two completely forgettable shows or very short lived. One, which was ranked the uh, fifth, one of the 50 worst shows of all time. And Happy Days was the third option. And I said, you know, there really was no option. Arthur Fonzarelli and, and then the Happy Days gang was, uh, was appointment television in my house. But it's not like we had a lot of choice, right? I mean, there just wasn't much there. And then, and then this sort of revolution in television happened. And yet, the networks have not been really at the, the leading edge of that, right? They've really clung to an old, not only an old business model, but an old formula for making shows. And I was struck by why, you know, what is it? What was the barrier? They're still premiering shows in September, you know, ending them in May, airing them once a week, you know, in an era where people binge watch and there's just a totally different sort of creative atmosphere at places like Netflix and Amazon and and HBO. And yet the networks have clung to the old model, the same model that was there when I was 10 years old in 1979. And how how long did it take you to write this book in particular? Because I noticed in your previous book, you said you started writing it in 1996. Yeah, well, this journey started about seven years ago when I, um, started really focusing. I'd always written about decision-making and problem-solving by area. And I really started focusing on creative problem-solving. 
and design thinking uh, work. And that was about seven years ago. Built a program at Bryant University where I teach for all first-year students to get exposed to design thinking in a highly uh, experiential, hands-on way. And, uh, and then I started looking at how companies were adopting different methodologies, whether it's design thinking or others, to try to spark creativity and innovation. And I saw a lot of frustration in companies. And so I started trying to understand the sources of that frustration. That was really the journey for the book. Are there any particular companies that you would see as exceptionally creative over the past few years? Well, I mean, I had the opportunity to look at a company like Pixar. Uh, I interviewed Ed Catmull a couple of years ago as part of the, this project. And, you know, I look at a company like that that's been able to churn out so many hit movies time and time again, delighting children and families. And, you know, you have to look and say, how do they do it? You know, what's going on there? And how do they create an environment? It's not just that they hire great people, right? I think it's too simple. And the premise of the book is it's not just about hiring great people. It is about the environment you create. It's about the the mindset, how you approach it. That's so important because frankly, I, you know, I, I sort of argue in the book that too many people blame. They say, well, you know, if we want to be more creative, what we need to do is hire more out of the box thinkers, get better talent. And I say, no, in fact, in most organizations, the talent's there. But there's uh, there's a lot of barriers that get in their way. And that's, you know, the real job of leaders is to unleash that talent, create that environment. So how might a leader in a, a smaller business help his or her team members overcome those barriers and stimulate creativity? I think, you know, one of the premises in any business, particularly in a small business, you know, often in a small business, the founders running the company, Brian, you know, and so I think. In many cases, that means they've set the vision, they've founded the place, they've got the strategy. But if they really want to, you know, tap into the creativity of their people, sometimes they've got to back off a little and restrain themselves and, you know, make sure they're giving room for those people to bring their ideas forward. A founder or a leader of a small business can sometimes be a very dominating presence. And that isn't always helpful when you're trying to really tap into the creative talents of people uh, in your organization. Does that same approach apply for? the CEO of a larger business? It does. I mean, I think there what you find is that it's not necessarily that, you know, because the the employees, especially on the front lines, are not interacting directly with the CEO, but the CEO sets a tone. He or she is is setting the climate in many ways. And and the way they approach problems, the way they approach their people trickles down, right? So they are exemplars, good or bad, for how to lead, how to put it together a team. And, And if they create a culture of fear, if they have a mindset uh, that gets in the way, it sort of trickles down, you know, that tone. And so their people lead in the same way in, so, in many cases. And then you find three, four levels down, you know, you've really inhibited people. And again, it's not because they're directly interacting with the CEO or his or her team, but because of the tone that's set right from the top. One of the things I liked about the book was how you proposed six mindsets for unlocking creativity. I was wondering if you, if you could describe those mindsets Sure. So the premise is that, you know, we hear a lot of arguments such as, you know, the things that get in the way of creativity are hierarchy, bureaucracy, short-term financial expectations. All true. But I look at this idea that there's a deeper explanation, which is that there are certain mindsets or, or organizational belief systems, shared belief systems, shared by many throughout organizations that get in the way. And so one is the linear mindset, the notion that we approach problem solving or planning in many companies in a very linear way. You do analyst research and analysis you develop a plan, you implement that plan. Very linear. And the creative process is fundamentally nonlinear. It involves a lot of iteration, experimentation, a lot of feedback loops. And we hate to iterate. We we like the linear process. Many managers do. And the notion of a somewhat nonlinear process is, is uncomfortable. And the notion of getting feedback or iteration of experimentation and the failure that comes with it sometimes. So linear mindset gets in the way. The benchmarking mindset gets in the way, which is we're obsessed with benchmarking our rivals. It's important to keep up with the competition, but benchmarking leads to fixation. We fixate on what they're doing and we end up copying them rather than learning from our competitors. And in many cases, we copy badly because we don't really truly understand the roots of their success because we're far removed from their own culture, their own organization. Three is the prediction mindset. We're obsessed with the question when someone comes up with a new idea, will it move the needle? You know, is this a big idea? How big is the market? What we're saying is we want them to predict the size of the opportunity. But the premise there is that they can accurately do that when an idea is in its nascent stages. And I provide a lot of evidence that we can't. We're not that good at predicting at those early stages of an innovative idea. And so we're putting people in a really tough spot where they're being forced to predict something they can't do well. So they either have to under-promise and not get funds or over-promise, and then they run the risk of under-delivering 
and putting their career at risk. Yeah. Um, so difficult. For quickly, four is the structural mindset. This is the notion that, well, the real way to spark creativity is all we have to do is make the organization flatter. If we just, you know, reduce the amount of hierarchy, if we just reorganize. I'm not against trying to make organizations flatter, but what I argue is that it's too simplistic a view that the notion that if we just change the boxes and arrows on an org chart, that will drive creativity. And yet, I argue leaders go, it's like a crutch. It's the easiest thing they can change. And so they lean too hard on structure rather than thinking about a lot of other key levers that they can pull harder, more difficult ones to change, like culture and climate. Focus mindset is number five. That's the notion that we all recognize now that multitasking is really bad for us, particularly when it comes to creativity. But the totally opposite end of the spectrum, total focus, building war rooms and innovation hubs and isolating teams and saying, if you just get away from it all, you can come up with a breakthrough. That's not quite right either. The highest odds of coming up with a creative breakthrough come from intense focus punctuated with a few purposeful attempts to get some distance from the problem to help really stimulate ideas. And lastly, the, the naysayer mindset. Too many organizations are filled with people always finding the reason why things won't work. They've taken the idea of the devil's advocate, which I argue is a very effective technique for enhancing critical thinking, a step too far into naysaying, into blocking ideas. So I talk about being an effective devil's advocate versus a naysayer. So there's the six in, in, uh, in two minutes or less, Brian. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic synopsis, Mike. In the focus mindset, uh, one idea that you, you talk about is focus plus distance. And you use the example of you two and the unforgettable fire. Um, so I'm just wondering if you, if, you, if you could explain just a little bit about how somebody should sometimes maybe have some distance from their work if, if they want to achieve a creative breakthrough like you two achieved with, uh, I think that was one of our first or second album. It was one of their early albums. Uh, it's a great story of how they, they go to Slane Castle in Ireland. They isolate themselves. They, they eat there. They sleep there. They record there. And I, you know, I argue that often we have this image of the, this is creativity. This is what we do. You know, you go to the mountaintop and get away from it all. And, and, you know, you can see things more clearly. I point out, though, that actually you two, while they did do incredible work in that castle when they isolate themselves, they didn't finish the album until they took a bit of a break and then came back together at Windmill Studios in Dublin and, and finished the album. And I talk about how Mark Twain would take a lengthy break sometimes. He said when the tank ran dry, you know, his ideas weren't flowing, and then returned to a manuscript or how Tolkien took years to write his incredible books. And so the idea is that, you know, you don't have to take a seven-year break like Mark Twain did uh, when he wrote Huck Finn. It can be shorter. It can be just a walk sometimes to clear your head. But also there's some ways we can actually get distance. So one of them, for example, is that psychologists have shown is that if we can step into someone else's shoes, role play, or walk a mile in our customer's shoes, or do some other thing to kind of step out of our own skin and adopt a different perspective, that's a way to get distance from a problem and spark creativity. Or another is if we travel, you know, if we experience how another culture looks at something, it turns out physical and cultural distance sparks creativity as well. If we imagine ourselves a year in the future, you know, I talk about Amazon, ask some of their software folks in the cloud division to, when they're working on a project before they begin, they actually imagine they're like a year in the future and they're writing the press release and the frequently asked questions document that will go with this new software service. And by stepping ahead and then coming back, they're gaining some distance from the problem. And the psychology is really clear. Social distance, temporal distance, physical and cultural distance, all of these ways are powerful ways to spark creativity in addition to, you know, taking a break, taking a walk, which can be helpful too. Yeah, well, taking a walk can be fantastic for, you know, unlocking fresh thinking if you're sitting at the desk all day. I'm just curious, what strategies did you employ when you were writing this book or your previous book? Because they strike me as books that you would have spent a lot of time researching uh, the various strategies and research that's built into the books. So how did you gain some distance from your work? Yeah, it's a great point. So for me, you know, one of the things that I'm able to do is, well, I did, you know, in this book in, in particular, I took a sabbatical. So I did step away from, from the daily grind of teaching to get some ability to focus, right? But I also, you know, had some travel in there. So I did get, you know, I got to Japan, I got to Europe, traveled in the U.S. while I was working intently on writing the manuscript. I think that really helped. And then I did get out there and I still didn't walk away completely from some of the executive work I do, leadership development work. So getting still in to see different companies and different company cultures periodically while I was writing was a great way to get away from the manuscript for a few days. And, you know, it sparks ideas, I think, continuing to see how different companies approach the workplace and different cultures. So 
for me, that was really useful. It did help to step away from the daily grind of teaching to get obviously some focus is important, but not, you know, I didn't literally hold myself up in the home office and not talk to anyone. I think that interaction is key. In fact, I did a lot of writing in a coffee shop, to be honest, because I found a little bit of human interaction was kind of good. I put the headphones on and, and get some focus if I needed it. You know, I found the kind of the buzz of the coffee shop was kind of useful at times. Yeah, I, I often write in, in the coffee shop. I'm also curious, you're a lecturer for the great courses and I've taken a number of the great courses over the years. What advice would you give to somebody who has written a book and they're thinking of turning their nonfiction book into a course? Perhaps, you know, they're, they're doing it on a, you know, a modest budget or don't have a huge amount of resources. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I've enjoyed, I've built several, three courses with the great courses. And I think for me, you know, I think it's, the way that people learn now, right? The ability to learn on the go and to learn independently. So, you know, I've met people who say, my courses are both in audio and video. A lot of people, they only listen to the audio, right? And so they're like, gosh, you know, you've been with me on my commute every day for three months, you know, and I've listened to your voice. I never met you. And now I get to see what you actually look like. But they, you know, they've used this time, which otherwise would be this dead time in the car, to really better themselves or other people say they listen at the gym, you know, while they're working out and that's been really effective. So, you know, they're like, yeah, we listen to music, but we also take some time. And, you know, in the great courses, my courses, at least they're 30 minute lectures. So they're small enough bites. They kind of work for people, right? It's hard to get people to sit for a very lengthy period of time these days, especially busy executives and managers. But I have people that are doctors and lawyers and other professions too, not just business people that have found some of the courses on decision-making, for example, uh, useful. And it does seem like if people are striving to better themselves and they're trying to use their time wisely. And so things like the commute or working out turn out to be really effective times that they get a lot of learning done, which is Pretty interesting. So for me, it's been rewarding. It's another way for me to get my ideas out there. You know, I I think the books are useful, but sometimes there's other mechanisms that work better for others. And so being able to do that, it's a great way for me to share my ideas. You know, you work really hard as a scholar to to develop these ideas and you just want to be able to get them out there and have an impact for me, an impact on how leaders are out there working in the world in some way. Yeah, 30 minutes is a perfect length, I think, for a course. Uh, it's enough time for a commute or, a, you know, a walk after the working day. I'm just curious, how do you put together a lesson plan for something like the great courses? Do, do you draft up the lecture titles or do you go back and review your, your book chapters or do you have some other approach? So for me, I, I, I do. A, it was a combination of working from the books and also working from course outlines that I have for the courses I teach at school, right? So look at my course outlines at Bryant University and I look at the books that I've written and I begin to build an outline of what I think a course structure would look like. And then, you know, the great courses has some fantastic people who work with you to help you on that. For me, the biggest transition was that in my actual courses with students at the university, whether it was at Harvard Business School or NYU or now at Bryant University, I'm teaching in a highly interactive fashion. I'm teaching by the case method. Um, I'm not doing a lot of lecturing. I'm asking a lot of questions, much more of the Socratic method that I teach by. Um, and the students have prepared some material in advance so that we can do that. So they were talking about Netflix today and they've read a case study on Netflix, or they've watched some video about the company. They've read a Wall Street Journal article. And now we're, we're having this discussion this, or I'm doing activities, experiential exercises, you know, that help them understand the material. For me, that's difficult. Then I have to transition that the great courses to turn it into a 30 minute lecture where it's just me talking. And that's challenging. That's the biggest piece of work that I had to do because I didn't have lectures in the can because I don't lecture uh, traditionally in the way I teach. And then, of course, the second piece is I had to be able to build a course that for those who weren't watching the video, they could still understand perfectly. So I had to be able to say this is something that if they're in the car and they can't see me, they can't see any slides, you know, can they understand it? And that's a, a real challenge, too, to really think carefully about how you present the material to do that. Because visuals are helpful, but if you can't use them, right, you've got to find another way to communicate your ideas. Do you find the readers of your books also take your courses or is it the other way around? It's a little bit of both, interestingly, right? Some people discover me through great courses and then go read the book. Others read some of my material and then they go, geez, we'd like to, you know, there's a, I think there's some value in hearing directly in, in my own voice. You know, me talking about, of course, some of the examples are different over the years. You accumulate, depending on the timing of exactly when I wrote the book or when I do the course. You'll see some some stuff. The the business strategy course has got some material in there that, you know, a fair amount of material that I haven't necessarily written about in any of the three books. 
So there's some material that's different there um, as well. So people, it goes both ways. You know, people discover you in one avenue and then kind of migrate to the other, which is really kind of neat too. Again, it's, it's just so rewarding to get the feedback and to hear from people who have discovered your work and see it has an impact. I, one of the most interesting has been doctors, which, you know, I, I just find that really interesting. Physicians have a particularly, uh, of course, I wrote, I did on decision making, but even the business strategy and leash, of course, they've discovered the course and found it useful. And I, I never quite thought about that as an audience, but I've heard, I've gotten emails from many physicians of all kinds of fields over the years who've discovered my, my work on the great courses. And, uh, and have found it useful because they found that, you know, look, they have to make critical decisions and they have to be able to do that. It's not business, but I use a lot of examples outside of business. So I think they found it applicable because of that. Yeah, I was, I was struck with what you said over the years, because if I remember correctly in your, your previous book, Why Great Leaders Don't Take Yes for an Answer, you describe how you started writing the book in 1996. And the book itself published in 2005, if, if the information I'm looking at online is right. Yeah. So, so how, how did you sustain your motivation for a big project like that for some nine years? Yeah, so what happened there, so to sort of explain the nine-year journey, is in 1996, I left uh, working at Staples as a project manager to go back to Harvard Business School to earn my doctorate. So the first four, four and a half years there were me achieving my doctorate and writing my dissertations. I wasn't really writing the book yet. I was figuring out what I was really interested in and writing this dissertation on strategic decision-making processes and in senior management teams. Then in 2000, I, I graduate and I joined the faculty at Harvard Business School. And, uh, and I, I'm writing some articles, as you normally do, and some case studies. And I'm not transitioning right to writing the book. I'm sort of, sort of getting my uh, feet under me teaching, too. And then after a couple of years of teaching, get some articles and case studies published, I said, OK, I really want to really now put this together in a book. And, and so then I sort of write, start writing intently there to write the book. So the journey starts in 96, but it goes through the dissertation and some teaching, some case study development, which is always great because you teach those case studies to students and you start getting feedback. You start recognizing what ideas really resonate. I wrote this case study in 2002 about Mount Everest expeditions and, uh, and the tragedy that occurred in 96. I read Into Thin Air and I read a bunch of other books. I interviewed Ed Vesters and David Brashears, who were great climbers who were on the mountain when the tragedy happened, though, though they were not, they had turned around when others kept going. I did all this research, wrote up an article, wrote up a case study, started teaching it and realizing, uh, you know, I had an inkling, I was that's why I wrote the case in the article that these ideas might be really useful for any leader looking at how these teams failed. Turns out it resonated incredibly well. And so there you go. Now I go, okay, I've got a great example to teach a set of concepts, but also to write about. And so, you, you know, I did a case on the Columbia space shuttle accident. Same thing. Like it really resonated. I go, aha, you know, and so you, as you write up case studies and teach them, you realize what examples are compelling and those flow into the book. If that makes any sense. It does. It does. You're, you're testing your ideas as you go and then refining them. I'm just also curious then what your writing routine looks like these days, whether it's for a course or an article or a case study or even a book. Well, my routine for the book, this last book, Unlocking Creativity, was on this case, I was on sabbatical. So I had a, you know, I had a full year away from teaching. And for me, I, I have this, I'm sitting here now in this very nice home office. And yet I wrote almost none of the book here. As I say, I did write it, a lot of it in the cafe. And the reason for me was, for me, what worked was getting up, showering, you know, getting the kids off to school and then going somewhere, you know, and I didn't drive all the way to my university office because I knew then I'd be interrupted by lots of people I knew. So I went to a cafe. I didn't go to the one closest to my house so that I wouldn't see too many people I knew. And that routine of getting out of the house, you know, and, and then getting to there was my way of really, you know, of focusing that. So, and then whenever I travel, I don't write on a plane or anything. I'm reading voraciously. That's when I do a lot of my reading. Got all that time on the plane and I use it to read or listen to podcasts or do other things to kind of get more examples, get more insight. You know, even though I've done all this research, you're always still looking for another good example or you've discovered a new psychological study you want to include and so you're reading it. So travel and the plane or the train was where I was doing, continuing to read like crazy. And then the cafe is where I would have my daily routine of writing. Is that what your routine looks like these days or your early morning routine? So I am a, I am a morning person. Yeah. So it's funny because if you go back to the first book, Why Great Leaders Don't Take Yes for an Answer, which uh, came out in 05 and I, my routine looked very different. My two girls were really little. My, my son wasn't even born yet. I was younger. I would write a lot at night. I don't do that anymore. Now I'm an early morning. I guess I've gotten older. I'm an early morning person. So 
Um, and I find that my mind's fresh and I really like that. And also other things in the day have not begun to interrupt me. And, and you know, the emails haven't started flowing, et cetera. I think that's key because back to the research, multitasking is really harmful for us. Yeah, multitasking is particularly harmful. So do, do you try to remove, you know, the devices from when you're focused on a particular project, like like a phone or email? You know, I do not completely only because, you know, as a dad, I kind of always going to make, I'm, you know, mindful of if my kids are trying to get a hold of me or something happens or my wife, but I at least try, I always silence it. And, you know, you just try to commit to, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to shut the email application down on my, on my computer and, uh, and shut the browser off and I'm going to work for a while. But you got to have breaks, you know? And so I would pretty much, I would focus at the cafe. I we were great. I would even leave my stuff there sometimes. And I'd go for a walk and go have lunch down the street, you know, or, or I just go, I literally had a loop. I walked that, you know, it was like a half mile loop that sometimes I'd go for a walk. So being able to do that is useful. Have you any plans to record any more great courses or any other books? I've had some discussion with them about, uh, you know, cause I have not done a full course on creativity on creative problem solving. I had a little bit in some of my earlier courses. So I'm thinking of turning some of the ideas in this new book into a course. And so I, I told them I got to get the book out. And uh, once the book's out and I'm kind of settled a little bit, start thinking about how to turn that into a compelling set of audio lectures. Right. So that's the hope I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I love, uh, I love doing it. So, but I needed to get the book out and, and breathe a little bit. Sounds like, sounds like a good plan, Mike. I look forward to taking that course. So where can people find you or your books online or your courses? Sure. So um, they can find uh, me and information about the courses and the books and my teaching, et cetera, at www.professormichaelroberto.com. Uh, they can find me on social media as well. And of course, thegreatcourses.com has uh, tons of information about, uh, about the courses. They have a full outline. You can see what all the lectures are. And, and you can see the different formats in which you can purchase, so download, DVD, you know, audio, video, however you like, you know, so as I say. But uh, yeah, thegreatcourses.com. But for me, it's uh, www.professormichaelroberto.com. And, and I'm on social media. Twitter is a great way to kind of find me and follow me. I post blog posts and the like there as well. Thank you, Michael. It was really nice to talk to you. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. If you did, please leave a rating on the iTunes store. And if you want to accomplish more with your writing, please visit becomearitertoday.com forward slash join and I'll send you a free email course. Thanks for listening.